Thank you. Housing and Urban Affairs will come to order. Thank you to our three witnesses. This is a hybrid, we're in the hybrid format. Witnesses are in person today. Thank you for making the effort to do that. Uh, at least a number of our colleagues will likely uh, ask questions from their offices. I want to first wish a quick and speedy and full recovery to our colleague, Senator Van Hollen, a valued member of this committee and of this body. Uh, he's been so active on these issues. We think of him and his family this morning. This morning, the Banking Housing Committee will examine how we can address a crisis facing millions of families, housing affordability. When we do this right, we lower people's energy costs, we reduce the risks to our communities from climate change. Outdated HVACs and appliances and poor insulations, insulation in homes needing renovation cost Americans money, lots of money on their gas and electric bills, and they contribute to climate change. 20% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions come from residential buildings. At the same time, most homes in the United States have some risk of climate change-induced disasters. Fully one-third of homes, 35 million of them, are considered to be at high risk. Any family, ask any family who's lived through a flood or a wildfire how devastating those disasters can be, the expense, the stress, the lost memories. Today, we'll hear from witnesses discussing how we make our homes safer, more energy and water efficient, more resilient to natural disasters. Homes that we build or renovate with these goals in mind, manufactured housing, single family homes, big apartment buildings are healthier and they save on energy. We, need, we know we need more homes in this country. For too long, we've not built enough housing to keep up with demand. In our hearings, we've heard previously from mayors and Akron, Ohio, and Senator Testers and Senator Daines, Bozeman, Montana, and, and other communities that we have far fewer homes than we need, nearly 4 million by one estimate. As a nation, we haven't invested in our affordable housing infrastructure. Barriers to new housing at the local level impede development, deny families access to opportunity. They keep prices artificially high. Secretary Fudge joined Congresswoman Beatty and me in Columbus this week to discuss some of those issues. Uh, the result is in a multitude of policy, policy decisions from the legacy of Jim Crow to redlining, to even to recent, more recent rules and regulations have helped create a national housing crisis that pushes costs up for families across the country, even before the pandemic. We know, and we've said many times in this committee, a quarter of all renters paid more than half their incomes in housing. Again, even before the pandemic, and we know what happens to those families when one thing goes wrong. Due to a lack of funding, federal housing assistance reaches only one-fourth of the renters who need it. We know that wages haven't even come close to keeping up with housing prices. A year of raises for some workers don't make up for nearly a half century of a Wall Street business model that funnels more and more wealth away from the workers who create it. We know that many of the affordable homes we do have are aging and need repairs. The housing shortage and high costs have been years in the making, and the pandemic only makes those things worse. Rents rose more than 11% on average between 2021 and 2022. Home prices uh, rose more than 18% over the same period. In some areas, price increases, as we know, have been much sharper. Wall Street firms, other outside investors, swoop into our communities. They snap up homes. They rent them out exorbitant rates. They further reduce the supply of affordable housing available to working families. In his book, Evicted, Matthew Desmond wrote that when families go to pay their bills, the rent eats first. And for most families, after the rent or mortgage, utility bills eat second. And those bills have been eating into families' budgets for years, too. We hear a lot of talk in this committee about inflation, housing prices, and energy bills take up a bigger and bigger chunk of, uh, of families' budgets all the time. Think about the stress workers feel every month when that electric bill comes in at the heat in the heat of summer or the gas bill arrives in the dead of winter. Nearly a third of families said they had difficulty paying energy bills in 2020 or had kept their home in an unsafe temperature because of the prospect of the size of those bills. This burden especially obviously is highest for the lowest income families and, and more likely for people of color. We can bring down housing prices and save money on these bills every single month if done right. Virtually any new or renovated housing will have a better environmental performance than older homes. And thanks to American innovation, we have building materials and technologies and appliances dramatically more energy efficient than products from only a few years ago. We j just need to actually get these, those into people's homes. Today we hear from our witnesses how we can help our efforts, all of our efforts to work together. 
We can build more housing protected from fires and floods. We can renovate and upgrade the homes we already have. That means lower emissions. It means jobs for building trades, workers, good paying, often good paying union jobs in communities all over the country, installing new installation, insulation, replacing windows, bringing in new appliances, removing lead paint first and foremost, building new houses and apartments. It means safer, healthier housing for our children. It means lower energy bills, uh, Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to join the chairman in wishing Senator Van Hollen a full and speedy recovery. He's a good friend and colleague, and I know all of us look forward to welcoming him back to the Senate and to this committee. Uh, Americans generally are needlessly facing record high housing costs. Home prices have steadily appreciated since the financial crisis, but they've absolutely surged since the pandemic. Now, no doubt, existing homeowners enjoy the appreciation and value of their homes, but first-time buyers and renters are just being priced out of markets. The Biden administration has correctly identified that there's a problem here, but unfortunately, its proposed solutions are not going to work. Just this week, the administration unveiled its housing affordability plan. Even though they purport to tackle inflation, the administration is really just doubling down on failed housing policies. They support the House passed reconciliation bill, which contemplates spending $75 billion on housing vouchers and $80 billion for public housing on top of all the tens of billions of dollars that we already annually spend on these programs. Uh, this will just increase demand without a commensurate increase in supply and will further drive up housing prices. They're also now considering pushing Fannie and Freddie into riskier activities that prior administrations understood to be too risky for taxpayers to have to pay for. They want taxpayers to buy loans on mobile home sales and help finance wealthy developers building apartment buildings during and even before construction begins. At least they've not yet fallen into the trap of cutting mortgage insurance premiums, which would only further spur demand and increase taxpayer exposure to risk. Now, if the administration were serious about lowering housing costs, one of the things it would do would be to remove the misguided trade barriers that drive up the cost of building new homes. They could lift tariffs on, on lumber, steel, and aluminum, for instance, materials that are universally used in buildings, including homes, across the country. In the last three years alone, American consumers paid over $13 billion more on steel and aluminum imports. And we know lumber tariffs contributed to price increases as well. Turning to today's topic, energy efficiency and resiliency in housing, I expect we'll hear calls for more government intervention to make homes more energy efficient. As the argument goes, families need to make their homes more energy efficient in response to impending climate change. And greening homes would have the added benefit of reducing energy costs. And the federal government can push these efforts through energy efficiency mandates and subsidies. This is the wrong approach. Efficiency mandates are not free. Consider California's mandate that many newly constructed homes and buildings have to have solar panels. The New York Times notes that adding solar panels and a battery to a new home can raise its cost by $20,000 or more. In today's interest rate environment, that'll cost a well-qualified buyer about $1,200 more per year. For a buyer with a more checkered credit history, it'll hit even harder. The government should not increase costs and restrict consumer choice by prescribing paternalistic regulations or subsidizing specific products. Manufacturers already have market incentives to develop energy-efficient products. When higher energy efficiency appliance and construction materials deliver savings that actually pay for themselves, consumers buy them. But regulations that prioritize energy efficiency over other consumer preferences only serve to limit consumer choice by preventing consumers from purchasing products based on those other preferences. Green subsidies are equally problematic. They're really a kind of corporate welfare that props up uncompetitive segments of the market. They also mask the cost of the administration's other energy policies, like its restrictions on pipeline constructions that are foolishly driving up the cost of natural gas and other fuels in many parts of our country. We should not be considering components of the Green New Deal at a time when inflation is outpacing wages. And let's face the fact, Workers in the Biden economy are for, falling further and further behind. Families are struggling to fill up their gas tanks and pay all the ordinary expenses they have to incur. Now is not the time to talk about mandating EV chargers or tankless water heaters. If government really wants to reduce energy costs for homeowners and renters, it should not forbid new homes from having natural gas hookups or mandate more energy-efficient appliances and devices with much higher upfront costs. 
The administration should instead tap American energy resources and increase supply, not tell people to spend tens of thousands more on home improvements they don't need or want. Today we'll hear from Katie Tubb, a researcher on energy policy who has concerns with federal mandates and subsidies for energy efficiency. As she notes, this administration has placed political preferences in front of American needs and developed a regulatory regime that chokes our energy supply. She also explains that onerous regulations have all kinds of negative consequences. They reduce consumer choices and they disproportionately burden lower income households. Ms. Tubbs' testimony provides important evidence as we consider whether energy efficiency spending should be further subsidized with taxpayer dollars. Now is not the time to sanction more spending with unproven value as the government should be focused on tackling inflation. If we're serious about helping working families, we need to take immediate action. The administration should immediately eliminate tariffs on construction materials like lumber and steel that artificially inflate home costs. President Biden should also restore American energy independence and substantially increase our energy supply. And we should recognize that the energy efficiency market is healthy. Let's not limit consumer choice and contribute to rising housing costs by unnecessarily intervening. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Toomey. I'll introduce the three witnesses. Uh, Ms. Ruth Ann Norton, President and CEO of Clean and Healthy Homes Initiative, welcome. Ms. Norton has been an advocate for healthy housing and racial and health equity in local, state, and federal policy for more than 30 years. She directs the nationwide work of the Baltimore-based Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. She was instrumental in Maryland's 99% reduction in childhood lead poisoning, rivaling only the success of the programs in Cleveland, I might add. And I mean, think about that. And uh, my state has uh, 600,000 contaminated lead pipes leading from main water lines into people's homes. The bipartisan infrastructure bill will replace those over the next few years, what that means in Maryland and Ohio and elsewhere. She's also an advisor to energy efficiency for all and advocates for the health and social benefits of weatherization investments. Uh, welcome, Ms. Katie Tubb, Research Fellow, Center for Energy, Climate, and the Environment the Heritage Foundation. Welcome, Ms. Tubb. She, uh, she researches and writes policy papers on energy and environmental topics for the Heritage Foundation. It's been a contributor to the Daily Signal, the Washington Times, National Review, National Journal, Real Clear Energy, and the Nuclear Town Hall. Thank you again. Welcome. Uh, Ms. Krista Egger, Vice President of Building Resilient Futures Enterprise Community Partners. Ms. Egger manages Enterprise's national sustainability efforts, including the Enterprise Green Communities Criteria, the nation's only green building program dedicated to affordable housing construction. She has more than 15 years experience leading energy efficiency and healthy housing initiatives with affordable housing stakeholders. She works to deploy equitable climate resilient solutions across the country. Um, welcome, Ms. Egger. Um, thank you all for appearing today. Um, Ms. Norton, please begin your testimony. Thank you. Profit. Healthy, safe, and energy efficient homes. We know from decades of this work that historic disinvestment in urban and rural and black and brown low income communities throughout this nation has disproportionately affected housing conditions across the country, endangering health, safety, and financial security of children, families, and seniors. In fact, over 30 million American families wake up every day in unhealthy and poorly weatherized homes that are increasingly susceptible to climate related events that negatively affect their physical, emotional, and economic well-being. Their homes with malfunctioning gas stoves, peeling paint, and mold are making them sick and directly contributing to their inability to lift out of poverty. Yet by optimizing climate, energy efficiency, and resiliency of investments through flexible home repair, we can solve these complex health and housing issues that exist for these 30 million Americans. GHHI has worked to transform how we address the twin tragedies of deteriorated housing stock and unhealthy families for, for decades. Through its direct services, research work, and policy, we have demonstrated the enormous health, economic, and social benefits of a housing upgrade model that aligns these measures, health and safety measures, with energy, resilience, and climate-related investments. What has this flexible approach shown us? 
contractors cross-trained to do this work in health, safety, and energy efficiency will start at four to $8,000 more than their peers. We have seen significant reductions in lead poisoning. The Senator cited Baltimore's reduction of 99% and across the country in places like Cleveland, Detroit, and Bullion. Reductions in hospitalization and emergency room visits have been reduced by 66 to 70%, causing important savings in our Medicaid programs. And we've seen large reductions in carbon emissions, energy costs, and trip and fall injuries for our seniors. It has also meant that we've seen improvements in school attendance in our studies by 62% and work attendance by 88% because parents are not taking their children to the emergency room for asthma, but they are able to get to the classroom, healthy, ready to learn, and compete for a lifetime. In, the, in this work, we have also seen housing stability increase by 80% and Medicaid savings, as I noted, uh, in the millions, with managed care experiencing 26 to 32% savings per month for, for these measures. These results achieved by our work and supported by agencies like DOE, HUD, the JPB Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and many others, prove that flexible home repair dollars that close the gap that often exist in the alignment of federal programs work and significantly increase housing stability, school attendance, work attendance, uh, and the like. At the federal level, it means that we will better unlock, scale, and optimally apply the congressionally appropriated funding in climate, energy efficiency, and resiliency. I'm here today to ask this committee to reinstitute its support for $33 billion in flexible home repair dollars to ensure that we lift the standard of housing and health and opportunity, that we address issues like lead-based paint while we address the issues of climate and energy. That would come in the form of $5 billion for a flexible fund for lead and healthy home repair, $25 billion of home funds, and $3 billion of CDBG funds to ensure that when we work in a home, that we are able to do a complete and full job for the future. These programs will serve long on, uh, as a long overdue catalyst for improving health and economic outcomes for families across the country, while simultaneously increasing private sector investment, reducing healthcare costs, decreasing the energy consumption. They will also reduce the barriers to weatherization enrollment and client deferral rates and ensure that we spend our time not on wasted uh, risk assessments and inspections that get deferred, but we're able to get the job done. We are also will be able to improve housing resiliency that allows for greater stability and to support the Just 40 in objectives by helping low-income residents equitably gain access to energy efficiency and work that is community-based and has market rate uh, job support. We know that further the implementation of this fund will create reliable demand for home repair and modification services, creating more jobs in communities with high rates of unemployment, underemployment, particularly among our youth. Our key findings in Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and alike have seen an alignment of health care investment also come through the ProMedica $100 million flexible fund to support 7,000 units across the country. In Detroit, we recently saw the Gilbert family aligned with ProMedica, the Detroit Energy uh, Organization, the city of Detroit, to support this solution because they saw that the barrier to fully addressing energy efficiency and resili resiliency to low-income communities was met the urgent need uh, for addressing health and safety. In New Jersey, they're looking at a whole house pilot program with Governor Murphy, Murphy and the Board of Public Utilities, and the Climate Imperative and the Energy Foundation are working to ensure the alignment of electrification and decarbonization with health and safety. We know that these, that these are effective ways to spend our dollars and to ensure that, as Michael McAfee says in his forward to the book, Greater Green Communities by Dana Borland, that we, we are able to advance solutions that prior, prioritize millions of people hurt first and worse by poor housing conditions and climate-related disasters. GHHI believes the smartest path forward to address the legacy of, of these issues is the creation of a flexible housing home repair fund that ensures healthier and more equitable opportunities for all. Uh, thank you, Ms. Norton. Ms. Tom, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak for, before you today. Um, certainly, weatherization and energy efficiency investments pay off. Um, efficiency is a desirable attribute, and Amer <clears throat> excuse me, Americans choose energy efficiency products that meet their unique circumstances and diverse needs. However, problems arise when federal subsidies and federal mandates enter the equation. As I detail in my testimony, there are a number of problems with federally funded weatherization and energy efficiency programs. First, federal weatherization programs have a history of waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer resources. The DOE Inspector General published a report this April detailing fraud in the weatherization assistance program at all levels, uh, substandard work, billing errors, erroneous or missing verification of applicant eligibility, insufficient training and oversight, and slow or non-existent consequences for bad actors. Second, federal weatherization subsidies and efficiency mandates have delivered underwhelming results and do not account for the diverse preferences of the American people. Unfortunately, too many of these programs do not look back at real world use and consumer experiences. While this can be humorous at times, such as the Department of Energy's assumption that Americans use their washing machines 392 times per year, which is more than once per day, uh, to justify their costly efficiency standards, it can also lead to phenomenal waste of resources. Third, climate change and CO2 emissions mitigation are not stated goals, considerations, or metrics in statute, which the DOE is to consider in implementing either the weatherization assistance program or its energy efficiency standards program. Even so, and regardless of one's opinion on the nature and pace of global warming, house weatherization and efficiency regulations are costly and ineffective ways to reduce emissions. For example, uh, the University of Chicago estimates a cost of reducing CO2 emissions through the weatherization assistance program of $329 per ton. The Biden administration's interim social cost of carbon is $51 per ton. Uh, I bring these up because of two uh, main reasons. First, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act includes an additional $3.5 billion over the next five years for the Weatherization Assistance Program. The last time Congress authorized such a flood of taxpayer spending was under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the context, the context for the Inspector General report I mentioned earlier. Secondly, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy is initiating scores of energy efficiency standards for common household appliances, as well as commercial appliances, from furnaces to water heaters, air conditioners, light bulbs, ceiling fans, washing machines and dryers, and I think of particular interest to this committee, manufactured housing. For both of these reasons, I think con congressional oversight is essential. Uh, in addition to oversight, Congress must address core issues that are hurting American households, namely policies that are driving up energy prices, housing prices, and inflation. My particular interest is with energy, which is a non-negotiable in many American house, in all American households, I should say. Energy is not a luxury item, and we cannot take a pass on it for later. So the more Americans must devote to paying for energy, the fewer resources they have to address other pressures from climate or elsewhere. And while energy prices increase, or when energy prices increase and are beyond the reach of those who can least afford it, the consequences can be dire. Congress, and particularly the administration, must devote more attention to policies that are unnecessarily driving up prices, injecting risk, and inhibiting Americans' ability to be resilient, whatever the future holds. Uh, with that, I'll close and I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tubb. Uh, Ms. Edgar, uh, thank you for joining us. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the urgency and opportunities to address climate change and housing affordability. I'm a vice president of the nonprofit housing organization, Enterprise Community Partners, where I lead our national sustainability efforts, including Enterprise Green Communities, the nation's only national green building program designed explicitly for affordable housing. Over our 40-year history, Enterprise has collaborated with local housing providers to build and preserve 873,000 affordable homes, invest $54 billion across all 50 states, and improve millions of lives. As part of our Building Resilient Futures initiative that I lead, we have set a vision that sustainable, resilient, affordable housing should be the norm and within every family's reach. 
It is that experience on which I base my testimony today, in addition to my oversight of Enterprise Green Communities and our Regional Resilience Academies, which teach property owners and developers how to reduce properties' carbon emissions and prepare for hazards like extreme heat, flooding, wildfires, and excessive wind speed from tornadoes and hurricanes. Just this weekend, I moved into a new home, one that I am fortunate to say has the benefit of being all electric. This is better for my health and for the environment than my old home, which relied on gas for water, he water heating and cooking. I say I'm fortunate because I know that most Americans have not yet been able to make this switch and may not even be aware of how important it is, let alone be able to afford it. But scientists have de demonstrated the importance of limiting emissions, including from the burning of fossil fuels for gas utilities and appliances. Increasing greenhouse gas emissions have escalated the frequency and intensity of natural disasters with multi-billion dollar consequences. One in three Americans have faced an extreme weather event in the past two years. And because residential energy use accounts for 17% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, to meet the administration's goal of cutting emissions in half the next eight years, the U.S. will have to dramatically slash emissions from housing. And prioritizing decarbonization in the affordable housing sector, and particularly in communities of color, is critical given the historic patterns of housing disinvestment in neighborhoods nationwide. Without an explicit focus on a just transition away from fossil fuels in the housing sector, health and wealth disparities will be exacerbated. By electrifying homes, we can also address sources of pollution that directly impact respiratory health. Children growing up in homes with gas stoves have a 37% greater chance of developing asthma. Just a 30-minute stovetop meal with gas cooking results in higher contaminant levels inside than are legal outside. It will take bold action to quickly address the built environment's impact on the planet so that everyone and every community can thrive. I commend this committee for its bipartisan commitment to examining how we can help protect the safety of all Americans and be better prepared for climate change. At Enterprise, we recommend Congress ensure that federal funding supports the stability and prosperity of communities through investments in climate-ready, affordable homes. We have demonstrated for more than 15 years that green affordable housing is not only a viable concept, but successful at scale. Through Enterprise's Green Communities Program, nearly 120,000 homes, affordable homes, have been built sustainably and will operate sustainably. Each year, certified developments are saving $31.8 million in energy and water costs, benefits realized by both owners and residents, and green community certified buildings reduce carbon emissions by the equivalent of taking more than 19,000 cars off the road annually. We've seen this achievement in nearly every state in the country. Second, we recommend Congress incentivize an equitable transition away from fossil fuels. The federal government must provide an overhaul of existing incentives, as well as provide new transformative investments for equitable electrification and deep energy retrofits. We need to help people get heat pumps and electric stoves. Third, Congress should set resilient building standards as the minimum quality standard for all new construction and substantial rehabilitation projects built with federal agency dollars. Our change in climate creates enormous challenges. How we design, build, and operate buildings will affect the pace of climate change. Healthy living environments with affordable utility expenses are possible, and they are critical to the future of resilient communities. On behalf of Enterprise Community Partners, I'd like to offer my gratitude to Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and all the members of the committee for your bipartisan leadership on these issues, and your recognition that we need bold action to move our country forward in a more climate-ready and equitable direction. So I look forward to hearing um, from others um, on the table and to answering your questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Egger. Uh, I'll begin the questioning, starting with Ms. Norton. Uh, lead paint still has devastating impacts on children, especially in the city I live in, in Cleveland. Healthcare and nonprofit education partners have come together to form, as you know, the Lead Safe Cleveland Coalition. Thank you for working with coalition partners uh, on this issue, Ms. Norton. Just a couple of qu quick questions. How, how does their work help protect Cleveland's children from lead and make housing more efficient? and affordable for their families, and what type of resources would help them do this work? Well, I want to first uh, really commend the Lead Safe Cleveland Coalition. It is one of the best formulations of civic action on lead that has existed in this country, raising over $100 million, uh, led by Dan Cohen at Mount Sinai, to really push uh, the alignment for the Cle Cleveland Housing Network, Environmental Health Watch, and Cleveland Clinic and others to come together to address 
what is the most damaging and damning environmental uh, impact on our children in this in the country? The lead paint, Senator, uh, just for the 1.1 million lowest income families who have lead paint hazards that we know of through the American Housing Survey, that that 1.1 million families just to solve that problem is 170 billion dollars, and and part of that is that we have to be able to address lead paint and the holistic housing that undergirds the housing structures. In Cleveland, the work they've done to really formulate the Lead Safe Cleveland Fund can be really benefited by the investments that may, are being made by Cleveland Clinic and ProMedica on flexible dollars that will allow them to ensure that if it's a weatherization program that's going in, we're going to also link lead, po lead poisoning prevention and to be able to ensure that no wrong door uh, can a family come in that if they have lead paint in their home, they're going to be able to address it. Big issues that we need to support in Cleveland and around the country is in workforce and worker capacity building. If we do that in, uh, by linking health and safety and lead and energy together, we will be able to have stronger housing and a stronger market to build community-based jobs. So I think that we have a bright future in what we see in places like Cleveland, but we need to have the, uh, the wraparound dollars around health and safety to make that fund aligned with uh, energy efficiency uh, dollars and climate dollars to really ensure that we will not go back and that families will be lifted out of poverty thank, and opportunity. Th thank you for that. Uh, switch Ms. Egger for a moment. Your written testimony describes how climate change exacerbates the housing shortage. States that for low and middle income homes certified under your enterprise green communities criteria, there's an annual savings of $31 million. What do savings like this mean for a low income family living in one of these homes? Thank you for the question, Senator. It's a critical issue. Um, when we speak about green building, we're talking about homes that are healthy, efficient, and environmentally responsible. And through our Green Communities Program, which you mentioned, we're delivering those to the folks who, who need it most, who are not able to withstand an erratically high energy bill and still pay for their prescription medications and, and other essential needs um, at home. So we've shown through our Green Communities work, which has certified homes in, in nearly every state in the country, that um, implementing these green efficient, healthy practices is feasible within the cost constraints of the affordable housing market, um, and that the incremental cost of building green is minimal compared to standard code with a simple payback of just about five and a half years, every year after that being a net gain um, for, the, for the vulnerable families that live in these homes. Thank you. In the last um, few seconds, back to you, Ms. Norton. What happens when a homeowner wants to use weatherization assistance to lower energy bills, but they also have lead paint or they also have a shoddy roof? Um, if, we, if we don't link these together and align them, the weatherization program can often be deferred until we have to address the underlying lead paint issues. But by aligning this with a flexible fund, we're able to to do those issues together. Doing that in an aligned manner, uh, Senator Brown, saves government 20%. So for every four houses that they would do in individual programs, by having the ability to align and link through flexible funding, you're able to achieve five houses. And the outcomes for families are enormous. As you know, every dollar we invest in lead poisoning prevention can yield up to $221 in return. But what it does mean is that kids get into the classroom healthy, ready to learn, and compete and earn for a lifetime. It also increases housing stability. But if we are not aligning these programs together and we're delivering them in a fractured system, then we have often long delays. And all of this work around lead paint is critical to allow us to be able to do the energy work and the climate work and the resilience work that is necessary because it has to be taken care of in order to enact those other funds. Thank you. Um, and we know that for years, Congress has provided funds for weatherization. And Absolutely. it's critical that we, as, as you point out, that we, that we repair, we provide home repair dollars so those weatherization funds are as effective as they can yeah, be. Yeah, if I can, and I think uh, Krista raised this as well, but there is a 20 degree difference in housing temperature in the lowest income communities in places like Cleveland 
Baltimore, Philadelphia, and other places, that where that, that has an, a, an impact not only, right, on the temperature, but on actual cardiac health, on respiratory health. So having to link these together um, are so incredibly important. Thank, thank you, uh, Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about is adding still more energy-related regulatory mandates, and then that raises costs, so then we increase subsidies, and we have this ongoing uh, interference with the market. So, so let me ask a question for Ms. Tubb just to start with. Is there a marketplace for construction techniques and products and appliances that are more energy efficient? In other words, like, is that a selling point? Do consumers become aware that some things are more energy efficient than others? Uh, in the absence of government mandates and subsidies, wouldn't energy efficiency still be a relevant market selling point? Absolutely. And I, you know, I think consumers express that in the choices they make uh, when they're purchasing uh, materials, equipment, appliances. There may be an education issue there, uh, and that is also a place for the market to fill that need. But I, I think Americans do preference efficiency when it makes sense for them. And, and um, the energy efficiency sometimes is a choice that involves trade-offs, right? I mean, I don't know, if you're thinking of, if you're in the market for a dishwasher, a dishwasher that's more energy efficient will save you money. That's attractive. But you might also want one that's quiet. You might want one that does it cycle quickly? Should the government decide which of those features is the priority, or should the consumer decide? I think the consumer, and, and it gets exactly to those trade-offs, that efficiency is one aspect that Americans value, but that for a variety of reasons, whether size of family, uh, durability, um, preferences, quietness, there are uh, other things that come into um, the decision-making process, and a, a bureaucrat, no matter well how well-intended, just can't understand the complexity of that decision-making process. And it's not uniform. Right? It's going to completely vary by, by, by consumers. I want to go to a point that you made that I think is a really important one about the elasticity of energy. I sometimes um, think you can infer from some of the things that I hear that if we just produce less oil and gas, then um, the people would consume less. How much uh, variability do people have in their consumption of energy as a, as a general matter? I, I think it's particularly inelastic when it comes to housing. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we see the consequences of that, particularly in winter, and they're devastating. When people can't afford energy, uh, lives are at stake, and that's how inelastic this is. And I think that's why uh, talking about reducing fossil fuel use is particularly problematic because you're talking about people's well-being. And just to put that in a little bit of context, 80% of Americans' heat, power, and transportation comes from coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, these are not inconsequential energy resources. Right. And sure, a family can decide, well, we just can't afford to go on vacation, and so they'll save some money and burn a little bit less gas because they won't drive to the place they were going to go. But the vast majority of energy consumption, as you point out, they really don't have any choice. They have to have the lights on. They have to have appliances running. They have to go to and from work. Um, and when we have policies that drive up that cost, the standard of living inevitably just declines, it seems to me. I want to just shift a little bit to resiliency outside of the energy issue. Um, I, I, I think there's a role for government, especially state and local government, in developing building codes that ensure that homes are built to a standard that makes them more resilient, especially in the face of natural disasters. By the way, it is worth pointing out, it's an objective fact, that the cost of the damage caused by extreme weather events has been declining as a percentage of America's economy. That's been a trend for some time now. But it still happens, and it's devastating when it does. We have a flood insurance program that insures homes against flood damage. It'd be one thing if the flood insurance program charged rates that were commensurate with the risk of a property, but we know it does not do that. It undercharges, and we know that for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is Congress has to bail out the program periodically to the tune of $30 billion over the last two decades. And yet, amazingly, the NFIP will cover the cost of repair or replacement, even if your home has been flooded multiple times. Um, does, does a flood insurance policy like this uh, actually encourage mitigation and resilience, or 
is there a moral hazard component to it? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in the program, but um, you know, GAO has noticed problems with the program with their high risk list. I would recommend uh, research by my colleague Diane Katz, um, but certainly a climate ready home is not one that we're constantly bailing out by these, these programs that uh, distort risk, um, you know, that dis or encourage risky development in floodplains, um, and I think discourage adaptation. You know, it, it makes no sense to have a climate ready home that is constantly in the way of uh, danger. And, and unfortunately, programs like this uh, just incentivize repeated decision making like that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Toomey, Senator Reed from Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, panel, for your testimony. And uh, I've long been involved in uh, energy efficiency improvements, working closely, particularly with my colleague, Senator Collins from Maine. And we've introduced legislation, S2361, which is the Green Retrofits Act. And what we would like to do is make energy efficient upgrades to HUD assisted multifamily homes, which pay billions in utilities each year. And Ms. Hager, I know you've done a lot of work at the intersection of green and affordable housing. Do you agree that there's a real need for green retrofits and affordable multifamily homes? Thank you for the question, Senator. Yes, unequivocally, yes, there's a need for green affordable retrofits, particularly for HUD assisted properties, which have the greatest deferred maintenance needs and the, and the greatest needs for, for upgrades. Um, we've seen that building retrofits can improve efficiency, which improves the amount or reduces the amount of utility bills, which residents face every day. They also can improve the health characteristics of, of those homes and reduce the pace that our climate is changing so that fewer disasters will actually um, um, impact those, those homes in the future. And once these efficiency improvements are made, there are long-term savings uh, to the uh, tenant if they are paying the fuel bills, and those long-term savings have to be included in the cost-benefit analysis. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes, sir. We completely agree that the life cycle costs must be considered. Um, if we're just looking at the upfront cost of improvements, we're, we're missing the, the bulk of of the benefit, um, and that must be. Considered. And in terms of incentives, I mean, most, uh, I think in my community, Rye, most of the low income homes, they're rental homes, and that the actual uh, inhabitants, uh, the tenants, don't make decisions about what type of utilities they buy or, or what type of. Uh, uh, what type of equipment they put in, stoves, et cetera. And there's an incentive in many cases for a landlord just to put the, the cheapest thing he can find or she can find and let the tenant pay the utility bill. Do you find that to be common? We do. It is more difficult to address um, the rental housing sector in some ways than the home ownership sector. Mm -hmm. And um, proposals and funding opportunities that promote green and efficient retrofits are particularly beneficial if they allow housing owners to retrofit all properties within their portfolio at once rather than a one by one basis so that maximum benefit can be achieved. Thank you. Uh, I'm also very much concerned about weatherization, and again, I've been working uh, over the years to help. Uh, we have legislation now, S3769, Weatherization Assistant Program Improvements Act, which would provide uh, $325 million to repair structural issue, repair homes for weatherization upgrades, increase the number of homes that they're able to serve. Uh, and as you've indicated, Ms. Norton, there are many, many uh, benefits to weatherization, including public health and safety, as well as the reduction of cost. Uh, can you speak to these uh, benefits again? Yeah, it, it, I mean, this is one of the most important things. Uh, and the reason that our organization moved from being the Coalition to End Childhood Lead Poisoning to the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative is that we were investing millions of dollars making homes lead safe and healthy. But without the alignment with weatherization, families were having cost driven up and housing stability was much lower and transient. By, by doing the weatherization assistance program, 
We have a dramatic impact also on asthma, on emergency room visits, on hospitalizations that result in millions of dollars in savings in Rhode Island alone, where we, we ran a flexible fund gap uh, funding program for the Attorney General's office to link Rhode Island housing uh, and the work in weatherization. But weatherization does more than just improve respiratory health for asthma, COPD. It improves housing stability, it improves cardiac health, and it also allows for community-based jobs that, as I uh, testified earlier, we know has, a, has an uptick of about four to $8,000 more when we, are cross, when we cross train, uh, as we've done through the Rhode Island Builders Association, uh, REBA, and others. So we see significant housing stability that improves by 84% when we enact climate investments and weatherization investments. And the significant piece is also intergenerational wealth transfer. Not only are families able to get to work and kids get to the classroom, but they were lowering their energy bills and building the market value of their homes. And one of the inequities that we see greatly in the United States, especially in black and brown communities, is that ability of intergenerational real estate wealth transfer. And it has a dramatic impact on that stabilizing factor and on equity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Reid. Uh, Senator Ossoff is recognized from Georgia from his office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening this hearing and thank you to our panelists. Ms. Norton, my first question is for you. Uh, I have introduced the Clean Energy for All Homes Act, which allows low and middle income households to receive a full tax refund uh, for the installation of energy efficient appliances and renewable energy production technologies on their homes like solar modules. I've also co-sponsored the Zero Emissions Home Act and the Hope for Homes Act to provide rebates to homeowners who invest in energy efficiency. Can you comment, please, ma'am, on what are some of the main barriers to more widespread adoption of technologies and products by low and middle income households and small businesses that improve energy efficiency and add resiliency, empowering those folks to generate their own energy uh, and potentially benefit from uh, net metering on the grid? Well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Senator, for, for your work and for the Clean Energy uh, for All Homes Tax Act. When, uh, even when investments pay off quickly, uh, many families can't afford the initial investment. So a tax credit can be an important way for families that make that initial investment. And it will accelerate the payback period for a positive return. By lowering the energy bills in a home and being able to get families across that threshold to the affordability to make that change, uh, it is so important. By being able to implement clean energy, we're able to do other things that include eliminating uh, leaky obsolescent gas stoves that is, uh, was testified earlier can increase asthma 37 to 42% uh, and also have poisoning uh, impacts on families. But and being able to move low-income families from gas to electric and from clean energy long-term is not only lowering the cost, it is dramatically improving their health and it is an opportunity to improve the structure of the home. And, and as I testified to, with Senator Reed's question on uh, the ability to increase uh, that housing stability, which is so critically important for how our children develop, how our older adults are able to age, and being able to have stronger climate and energy investments allow greater housing stability. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Continuing our conversation, let's talk about weatherization. The weatherization assistance program helps low-income households increase energy efficiency in their home. Uh, can you comment on how improved weatherization helps save folks on their energy bills, especially when energy prices are high and getting higher? And can you also comment on uh, how your organization works uh, to ensure that folks who need repairs to their homes, which may make them ineligible for assistance under this program, does that work? And what recommendations you have for Congress on this front? And if you can perhaps hold that to one minute, respectfully, I've got a final question for Ms. Egger. Of course. Uh, so let's let's be clear that the low-income families living below the poverty level have an energy burden of 42 percent. 
which is outside and disproportionate. So being able to enact weatherization assistance immediately has a dramatic impact on lowering those energy bills and aligning those uh, aligning flexible home repair and work to reduce things like lead paint allow us to actually do this more efficiently, more effectively, and ensure that the investments in weatherization are sustained uh, over time and not degraded through mold, mildew, moisture, or other issues. And we are able to really move a, that, energy sa that, that energy savings into wealth building uh, for families being able to uh, enact better health and better wealth building. Thank you so much, Ms. Norton. And my final question is uh, for Ms. Egger. And in coastal communities like Brunswick, Tybee Island, St. Simons Island, St. Mary's, there is substantial persistent flood risk to homes, critical infrastructure, small businesses. Uh, we're seeing storm surge events and tropical storms uh, become more frequent and more severe. In Brunswick, uh, every single home is at risk of flooding. And this is a community where 36% of the residents are living at or below the poverty line. I am focused every day on helping coastal Georgians to prepare themselves for flooding, to help those communities become more resilient. That's why I've been focused on uh, storm surge protection for Tybee Island. Can you, based on your expertise, please, Ms. Egger, make recommendations to me, to this committee, and to the Congress for how we can help coastal communities like those in coastal Georgia and across the country become even more resilient to flooding, storm surge, and tropical storms. Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. I actually grew up in Statesboro, Georgia, and have enjoyed many a dish of Brunswick stew and <laughs> understand the, the issues that, that you're describing. In short, um, we understand that the issues of, of flooding will only be increasing we consider climate change a threat multiplier in exacerbating the vulnerabilities of folks who are living in poverty. And um, uh, to, to answer your, your question quickly, we would recommend that Congress provide more funding to elevate homes to ensure that they are less at risk of flooding, to provide funding for buyouts of, of folks who are living in homes who can no longer afford to live there or able to sell their homes because of the lack of flood insurance, and we would encourage Congress to authorize FEMA to slow the increase of flood insurance premiums for folks who have low and moderate incomes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. Senator Smith from Minnesota is recognized in person. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ranking Member Toomey, and thanks to all of our witnesses today. I'd like to follow up on um, sort of the theme of questions that some of my colleagues have asked. And um, Ms. Eggers, I'm going to direct Ms. Egger, I'm going to direct this question to you. Um, so as you have all pointed out, residential energy um, use alone accounts for 20% of all U.S. emissions. And uh, so there's an important opportunity here to, um, through innovation and investment, to address this, um, this challenge. And there's a big opportunity to reduce um, energy costs for um, consumers. And if you think about it, I think it's really telling that in 2020, nearly 27% of all U.S. households had a hard time paying their utility bills. Um, and households of color, black and brown households, experienced nearly twice the rate of energy insecurity struggling to pay their bills. So, but here's the problem, right? Electric and energy efficient technologies have an upfront cost that means their lower income households are sort of boxed out of making that investment. They, they, it's hard to sort of electrify everything when you can't afford that upfront cost. So Ms. Eggers, could you just talk about this? What is the value of addressing that upfront cost of deploying energy efficient products, electrifying everything, um, so families aren't boxed out of realizing that long-term benefit? Of course, it's a cost benefit, but it also is a, um, a health benefit for them as well. And what should we be doing specifically to address that? Thank you, Senator, for the question. And um, I, I would like to commend uh, some of the actions that Minnesota Housing is actually taking today in order to encourage those investments and, and bring them to reality. Um, we really see that affordable housing 
is not just about the price of rent or the price of your mortgage. It's also the price of your utility bill and the cost of transportation in, involved in living there. Um, so investments in energy efficiency actually, um, although they do come with an upfront cost, do ensure long-term affordability. And those are the types of investments that we, we need more of so that we can make sure that vulnerable families don't fall further into poverty. And so if we just let the market drive those decisions and you have those high upfront costs that then box families out of making, you know, being a part of it, I mean, doesn't that um, sort of further the inequities that we see in our community in terms of health equities and, and energy cost inequities? Yes, Senator, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the folks who need these investments most are the least able to pay for them themselves. And that's where federal or state level assistance is really critical to ensure that those families can reap the benefits that you're describing. So those kinds of early investments, whether it's a tax rebate or some sort of a, a, some sort of a strategy to overcome that upfront barrier, that upfront cost barrier, can advance a whole series of goals that we have. And in the long run, the ROI in that is going to be, um, is going to be good, right? I mean, that's the point. This is not like a, this is, this is improving the long-term ROI. I, I couldn't agree more. The cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action in this case. Now, th this seems like this, I think Senator Reid hit on this a little bit as well, but, you know, you've got, if you think about the issue of people who are renting their homes, they don't own their own homes. 36% um, of American households rent their own homes. These are disproportionately families of color. They're young people. They're low-income people. Um, I thought this was really interesting. Almost 40% of renters are living in housing built before 1970. So these are, again, folks that are going to benefit the most from these sorts of energy retrofits, um, 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 moving appliances to um, electric appliances. Um, but here's the thing. A lot of those buildings are owned by smaller, maybe, you know, a family or, a, you know, a, somebody who owns one or two units. They're not a big business without a lot of capital. Um, to invest in doing those energy retrofits. So could you just talk a little bit about what we can do to make it easier for those um, sole proprietor, um, renter, owner, you know, to, to participate in this? Absolutely. There is no singular silver bullet. It does, it will require a multi-pronged approach, both from support for manufacturers and distributors of energy efficient and electric equipment to ensure that the costs are low enough that, um, the small owners and, and renters that you just described can afford to purchase these. Um, and that uh, paired with capital as well as technical assistance to ensure that mom and pop landlords who don't have the bandwidth to understand these solutions can connect with folks who can walk them through every step of the way. Right. And, and a part of this is aligning the incentives so that they are all having us row in the same direction. I'm, mis I'm mixing up my metaphors here, but you know what I mean. Absolutely. We've seen great success. Actually, in, we're working on an initiative in partnership with GHHI presently that is um, uh, braiding together a philanthropic utility, private, and, and nonprofit support in order to make this type of work happen, and that kind of model is going to be essential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Smith. Uh, I have a couple of questions as um, Senator Menendez is on his way, and uh, the ranking member can certainly do that too. I'm sorry for the bit of a filibuster, but important questions. Ms. Egger, if you would uh, respond. Your testimony mentions that low-income families and communities are more, more vulnerable, of course, to climate-driven disasters. We've known that for generations. Uh, I remember as a, as a kid, I carried the plane dealer, the Cleveland newspaper, and I remember the front page one time where this whole community along the Ohio River was wiped out. I don't think we talked about climate-driven disasters then, but was wiped out from Ohio River flooding, which happened every few years and now happens more often. So that's just one example of what we know. What, what are your recommendations, Ms. Egger, uh, to help those households and those communities recover? It's a great question, and I think there must be investment prior to a disaster occurring, as well as investment to help with a recovery, which, which you're recommending here. Um, types of um, federal actions that are, are feasible are requiring um, resilient building standards to ensure that homes are able to 
um, withstand floods um, and withstand other, other types of climate disasters. And then on the back end, after recovery, we need to ensure that assistance can get to vulnerable homes more quickly than it currently does um, so that folks can um, uh, return to their homes and begin rebuilding um, quickly. And we certainly know that those people most likely to be hurt are the people with uh, softer or you know, with, with weaker voices, if you will, in the political I mean, people that are not able to get the community, the mayor, the governor, uh, don't have quite the, 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 the influence with them that people in other neighborhoods might have, I assume. I, I couldn't agree more, Senator, yes. And that's why these types of assistance programs are necessary to put in place so that we can immediately provide that type of, of assistance and support. So, so talk, thank you. So talk more for a moment about um, how these families can mitigate this damage before it happens. Talk about a little bit more about preventive actions um, other than addressing way better than this country or this government has the issue of climate change. But talk about how we can prevent some of this. Absolutely. There are different strategies that are relevant depending on the types of hazards that are relevant for a given community. So it really starts with understanding the risk, first understanding the different types of hazards that a community is vulnerable to, and then what types of risks those particular hazards pose to a community. So for instance, if the hazard is flooding, perhaps the greatest risk is that homes will be flooded, or perhaps it's actually that the critical road to access economic job centers from the community will be washed out. So understanding the hazard, then the risk, and then implementing um, solutions that respond are, are critical. With um, protect, protective measures and um, thinking about flooding in particular um, can be elevating homes in the design stage, for instance, or in a retrofit fashion above base flood elevation to ensure that we're planning for future levels of flooding. Um, other strategies which might be relevant for other types of disasters may include for wildfires, for instance, making sure that roofs are not built with combustible materials, making sure that windows are not single pane but double pane so that they slow the flow of heat more quickly, and ensuring that there's a buffer zone around homes uh, without combustible materials so that fire is um, less likely to spread as quickly. Thank you. Senator Toomey has. Yeah, just um, turning to the uh, issue of energy costs. I think it was Ms. Norton who m made the point that people who live below the poverty line pay a huge percentage of their income for energy. Um, Ms. Tubb, I know you've, you've done a lot of work in this area. So I represent Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is the number two state in America in the production of natural gas, behind only Texas. And in Pennsylvania, we have a glut of natural gas. And we have all kinds of well drilling capacity that is idle. That's despite the fact that natural gas prices have gone through the roof in Europe. And they're pretty expensive in a lot of parts of America. And it has occurred in recent years that Russian LNG tankers have sailed into Boston Harbor to provide natural gas to New England. All of this is because we don't allow additional pipelines to be built to connect the production of natural gas in Pennsylvania to the demand for it in, say, southern New England. Have you looked at all into the extent to which the refusal to build energy infrastructure, the privately financed, the private sources are perfectly happy to do this. Have you looked at the extent to which the lack of the ability for developers to build that infrastructure is affecting cost of energy for consumers? Um, you know, I, I can't give you a number off the top of my head, but the Energy Information Administration has looked particularly at the Northeast and their energy reliability and affordability problems because of that exact issue that the Northeast uh, has prevented either expansion or additions to their pipeline infrastructure such that they pay much higher energy prices and have to rely on more uh, international imports as opposed to uh, domestic production. I think your neighbor to the north, New York, is a, a striking counterpoint to the experience in Pennsylvania. New York doesn't allow hydraulic fracturing, and yet they're a very energy-rich state. Um, so th the point is, you know, that uh, policies have consequences, and unfortunately, Northeasterners are paying for that in their utility bills, which I think is one reason I'm here, is that this is a root problem, and I think 
Congress is uniquely situated to, to address some of those root problems that American homeowners are, are dealing with right now. Um, so, um, you know, if, if people in southern New England are going to be burning gas, and it's a question of whether it's Pennsylvania gas or Russian gas, um, are you familiar at all with the difference in the environmental standards that are applied in the United States on gas extraction compared to the environmental standards applied, say, on Russian gas extraction? Certainly. I, I don't know that there's another country, perhaps maybe Canada, that does it better than we do in the United States, both in terms of uh, protecting labor and the environment. So when we saddle our own industry with uh, standards that don't have meaningful environmental benefits, all we're doing is granting that space in the market to somebody else, Russia, OPEC, other nations. So that that uh, these energy resources are demanded in the United States and globally, and that hasn't changed in decades, and the Energy Information Administration doesn't expect it will change for, for decades to come. And so I think those are the realities that we need to have in our mind as we think about policy moving forward um, and the consequences of making uh, the energy industry in the United States uh, less competitive. Uh, it, it will be ceding ground to our competitors, not displacing energy for other resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Toomey. Uh, Senator Menendez from New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Person. Thank you for uh, keeping the hearing open. I appreciate it. Thank you to our witnesses. Uh, there's no question that our housing start needs to be expanded and revitalized. As we build to meet the challenges of the 21st century, we should be looking to leverage the power of mass transit mm -hmm. so that we can curb uh, climate change, including, uh, I, I should say, inducing car emissions. And that's why I led the charge with my Livable Communities Act, which creates a federal grant program to incentivize the coordinated development of new affordable housing and transit. By leveraging transportation assets, this legislation will spur economic development, address affordable housing needs, expand access to good jobs, while at the same time cutting carbon emissions. And uh, I'm happy to see that uh, the Build Back Better proposition included $4.5 billion for this innovative housing supply solution. Uh, but so, Ms. Egger, should, uh, 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 shouldn't we be strengthening our housing stock in conjunction with transportation hubs so that we can connect people to good jobs and incentivize more energy efficient mass transit? Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Senator. We, we do see that transportation is often the largest expense after housing and utility costs for families. Um, and we recognize how much of an impact uh, transportation has on climate change in regards to emissions. There are two examples that I can think of that um, lead credence to the, the proposal that, that you're bringing up here. One is through our experience with green communities, our national green building program for affordable housing. We actually require that all new construction properties not in rural or tribal locations are located within half a mile of a transit hub for the emissions, the economic um, reasons uh, that, that you're alluding to as well. Um, and another example that I'd like to offer um, is actually in relation to an initiative in, in Denver, Colorado. We actually just recently celebrated a significant milestone with our transit-oriented development fund in the Denver regional area where we've now invested $50 million in creating 2,100 homes that are transit connected and affordable housing. And this type of investment, as the TOD loans are repaid, the capital goes back into this, this fund, which can support more developments which have these same attributes. So that's a type of example of fast, flexible, ready capital that can support these types that's of great. properties. Now, turning to a different uh, topic, flooding is uh, the most costly and frequent natural disaster homeowners face. Unfortunately, climate change is only going to make that worse. Right now, most federal assistance uh, to make homes more resilient comes after the natural disaster. Communities would be much better served if the federal government would uh, make more tools available to reduce flood hazards in high-risk areas before the next storm strikes. And for every dollar that we invest in mitigation, uh, it has been proven, the federal government saves $6 in disaster relief spending. So. Uh, I, I'd like to be able to invest a, a $1 for every six that I'd get back. So uh, shouldn't the federal government make more funding for pre-disaster mitigation to make homes more resilient to flooding before homeowners find themselves in hard's way? Absolutely, Senator. The preemptive investments are much less costly than fixes after the fact. And 
if I may share a relevant example from my organization's experience with preventative um, flooding mitigation measures, we've seen the types of these benefits firsthand. Um, when a heavy rainfall flooded New Orleans five years ago and tested the Faubourg Lafitte development that Enterprise and Providence Community Housing created um, and rebuilt after Hurricane Katrina, we saw that about five years ago, this deluge flooded the city. Residents found their streets waist deep in water, but Lafitte escaped harm. Water did not breach the first floor of this building because the homes had actually been built two feet above baseline flood elevation. So when the water receded, folks were able to return to their, to their daily lives, and there was no need to offer any claims against the National Flood Insurance Program because there was no harm done. So um, better underground infrastructure is needed to ensure that uh, water drains quickly from cities and communities, but we were able to do what was within our control to reduce risk mm -hmm. and with that type of preemptive investment. Well, my bipartisan NFIP REACT prioritizes pre-disaster mitigation through increased cost of compliance coverage reforms uh, so that homeowners are up to date with the latest building code requirements. Uh, it also creates the availability for elevations and improvements uh, to the nation's most flood-prone homes, and I look forward to working with the chairman on it. May I have one last question, Mr. Chairman? Um, Ms. Seger and, and, and Ms. Norton, can investments in existing federal programs like Choice Neighborhoods be leveraged to address climate change by creating long-term sustainable and affordable housing supply? Uh, for example, uh, last year the city of Candom in my home state of New Jersey received a $35 million Choice Neighborhoods grant which leads to the development of 350 new energy efficient units of housing and, and, and at the same time, as we've been discussing, improves access to mass transit. Uh, what do you think about that? I, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, programs, HUD programs, like Choice Neighborhoods and like CDBG, DR in, in particular, are ones which can pair um, uh, resilient, green, efficient building practices with the creation of affordable housing so that those two outcomes are realized simultaneously. Thank you, Senator, for the question. And the, the work that we're doing with the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities to build a whole house uh, response uh, to occupied housing, I think choice neighborhoods can really, in Camden, build that infrastructure of helping to train contractors. Choice Neighborhoods is, is building and preparing neighborhoods. One of the things that we can do is help to train from the community the contractors in this resilience work and, and in flood mitigation work, but also help to map the occupied housing at risk and to be able to know, especially where we have our elderly, uh, we have elderly uh, residents or where we have people living in basements or in, in true flood risk, by using Choice Neighborhood flexible dollars, you're able to really build that infrastructure to know ahead and do assessments and build that workforce capacity and then align these dollars with weatherization and flexible housing to address those risks that occur. So the Choice Neighborhoods is a catalyst, in effect, to be able to, uh, to really unlock and unleash the potential of other programs mm -hmm. uh, to get ahead of this, especially in the occupied housing, where you will have people much, much more at risk um, in the older housing stock. Thank you for your insights. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Senator Menendez. Um, a couple comments before we close, and thank you, all three of you, for appearing, and Senator Toomey, for um, your questions. Uh, you both mentioned, this isn't really a form of a question, but I want to just kind of outline this. You both mentioned that Formerly red line neighborhoods are hotter than non red line neighborhoods. I read some time ago a book called Urban Forests, and in that book they described a, 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 an aerial picture of LA County that uh, Beverly Hills in the spring and summer was 50, if I remember, 51% tree covered, while South Central LA was 13% tree covered, and we, we know what that means um, in terms of, of energy and clean water and clean air. and safe neighborhoods even, and I, I have legislation to work on to encourage urban tree canopy to lower heat and uh, heat and provide other kinds of climate benefits. So um, I will be talking to perhaps some of you about that. We should agree that making housing more affordable should be a goal for members of this committee on both sides. We've heard today how energy efficiency, safety upgrades can bring down housing costs and utility bills. I hope we take the lessons 
from today's hearing and work collectively to make investments that will lead to more stable, safer neighborhoods and communities. Uh, for senators who wish to submit questions, those questions are due by close of business uh, one week from today, May 25th. To the three of you, again, thank you. Per committee rules, we ask that you respond to any of these questions within 45 days of receipt. Thank you again. The hearing is adjourned.